So uh, a few days has passed since we last uh, videotaped some stuff. I'm not sure if that's the right word. Anas will probably correct me on that. Anyways, it's been a few days and uh, as always, it's a little hectic in the shop. Uh, I'm preparing for my launch 15 and are pretty far with the knives. It's two weeks until I'm flying out to the New York Custom Knife Show. So I have a bunch of work laid out in front of me for that as well. So we've been grinding uh, blades for the Casino and the Monte Carlo. They are at a point now where what's needed is hand finishing. Everything is finished ground on the bill grinders. The way that I grind these blades, they are very, very fast to hand finish afterwards. But um, I'll somewhat take you through the process. The uh, first thing is a little polishing. I'm gonna scotch bright the edges just a little bit. For instance, I don't know if you can catch this, even though I, I ground this to a high finish there's just a little scratch here and I'm, I'm gonna take that out on the buffer this machine will make your day a really bad day it will throw these blades right at you if you're not careful so please be super careful safety first all that and don't do what i do do what i say right that's what my dad used to say so while i'm not gonna talk about all the processes that we're going through. After all, this is not a tutorial. This is just a, a, uh, a look, vlog. a vlog. <laughs> so I'm learning something new. I, I guess that's what the young people call it <laughs> these days. I, I'm still on blog. Anyways, professional finish of a custom knife. One of the most important things is everything at its right time. So. Each process is important, but the order of the process is, is even more important. So you're progressing to a finer and finer finish as you go. And if you skip a step or if you have to go back and redo something, well, it's all over. That is just one of the things to be very consistent about and very aware about is that whatever you do, be super consistent about whatever you're doing. In this case, I'm polishing some small areas on the blade where the grinder and the polishing wheel can't access. So I'm doing that with this little tool here. As with almost everything that I do, I always batch my work. So in this case, I'm working on six blades at a time, which is pretty normal for me. Four to six to eight to 16, something in that, in that neighborhood is usually what I always work on. So since this is on video, I only work on six, just so we can actually progress a little. Those six knives are for the show? Uh, these are for launch 15, my online knife show. So we haven't uh, started filming the show knives. We've prepared a bunch of work on those, so you'll see that later. So these are for the upcoming launch 15 show. So yeah, show, but not the New York show. Let's get some work done. So this looks fairly easy. And after 20 years, most of this, most of what I do, I find relatively easy. With everything, there's some challenges now and again, but having years of, of experience is what makes this easy because just this little technique is, uh, seems like, well, that's easy. And smarter people than me would probably have figured this out much sooner. I didn't. So <laughs> this, this has been years in development. Well, maybe not this specific idea, but before I actually realized, oh, just use some masking tape and you're good to go. Sometimes I shake my head on how ridiculously simple an idea could be. Simple is most always better than complex. So the process that I'm preparing for now and uh, about to start is probably called hand satin finishing or hand rubbing, just like the sound of hand 
setting better, which is a process where I use fine sandpaper and I polish the flats. So the end result that I'm after is a very even finish where you will see the grind lines or the, the polishing lines are very even and without any small scratches in them. This is one of those things where there's, there's no shortcut. You just have to practice. I've been practicing for 20 years and uh, I think I'm fairly good at it, but still it requires some effort and some redoing every now and again. And trusty WD-40. Oh yeah, that's the uh, Knife Makers Cologne. How do you know when you're done? That's again experience and then checking the work when I think, well, this should probably be around it. And I will go in with my optimizers and I'll turn the lamp to move the reflection of the blade and I can, I will see if it looks good. At this point, it's super important that you don't contaminate the surface with grit. So everything that I do is along the, the finish of the blade. Any movement across the blade will risk adding scratches. So even though this is a dirty paper from the process, if I move it along the finish, it won't harm the finish. If I move it across the grain, it will certainly cause just tiny scratches. It's kind of similar to when you uh, when you prepare wood for the, the final finish? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, steel will just show every single little scratch. This is a pretty good finish. So with, with my custom knives, I am my worst critic, which I feel is, of course, important for the end user, but in reality more important for me because that gives me a stronger sense of confidence in sending these knives out to people who are paying a good amount of money for them. But even as careful as I am, of course, every now and again, things can slip, but knock on wood, that doesn't happen too often. But I recall, say, 10 years ago or more, just a change of light from my shop to standing behind a table at a show, suddenly you would have a very different light. Even from across the table, you could watch or look at a knife and see what's that scratch right there how would that even be possible that i didn't catch it before so that is one thing that i learned from that experience is even though i checked the finish and checked it more than once just walking outside with the different light will show something that you you can't see under a normal lamp so that is one of my pet peeves is to to really really check my work very, very careful before saying that I'm done. Not to say that uh, I can't improve on, on what I do. I've reached a level of professionalism where I'm also able to say to myself, okay, this is as far as I can achieve on the quality. That's a saying that I really, really, really distaste is this is good enough that's that's not that's not in my vocabulary there's no such thing as good enough now 20 some years into being full-time and i've made i probably made 16 1800 folding knives if not more i have yet to make a knife where i'm 100 percent satisfied but being 100 percent satisfied and agreeing with myself that this is as far or this is as good as i'm able to make this knife that's two very different things so that was last of the finishing touches on these blades. Next up for this batch is engraving logos. But if you have a look here, these are the blades that we ground a couple of days ago. I already finished those. These are damascus steel and I masked off some of the internal layers of the blade where the mechanism will need clean steel. So I mask this off so um, the steel won't etch here. Now we're gonna mix up some sulfuric acid, which is not for the faint of heart. And I wouldn't call it dangerous, but you really have to know what you're doing. So um, don't try this at home, kids. And uh, welcome to the beautiful spring of Denmark. 
it's actually not all that bad. It's nice temperature out. Anna's is in a t-shirt. <laughs> Next up, we will have cocktails in the sun. Maybe not. Gonna mix up some sulfuric acid, which is something that you really need to be super careful about. I, I actually haven't met that many knife makers who use sulfuric acid for this. They usually use ferric chloride or something else. What sulfuric will do is it will give you a very deep edge and, and that's what I'm after here. Is that making a sound? Yeah. If you're not careful here, you'll have a very violent reaction between water and, and, and the acid. So always acid and water, never water and acid. There's a saying in Denmark, like a way for you to remember what to do and what definitely not to do. If you pour water into acid, it will explode in your face. I hear it's a bad thing. What's the process here? So the blades are cleaned, so there's no fingerprints on them. And I'm hanging them from a old toolbrush. In this case, it's a Sendium, <laughs> which is um, more important than you might think, or maybe it's not. I'm using titanium wire to hang the blades from because the acid won't have any reaction to the titanium. And placing the blades so they don't touch each other. And now just sink them into the acid and leave them there for five minutes. Again, don't try this as home kids. I don't recommend doing this at all. This is just the way that I established a process that works really well for me. So this is just water. I rinse the blades in and just be really, really careful if you mess with this. I just place the blades in thinner to remove the uh, resist. The rest of the residue from... Uh... Yeah, the... Um, the paint, which actually didn't, it didn't protect the steel all the way as I wanted it. This acid stuff is strong and hot, but um, I know that it didn't go in deep in the areas that were painted, but might need a little extra polishing in those areas. So now we have the edge blades, but still unfinished. These are in a very rough state still. So the main reason why I enjoy deep etching this Damascus steel is that everything I make is tools first and foremost. Damascus steel, Damascus, is the pretty face of a blade, but I'm using it as a decoration, but it can't work against the, um, the criteria of the knife being a tool. So the deep edge will give a finish that's more resistant for scratches during use. So for some of the less deep edges on the blade, you will see a ton of scratches the first time that you use it. And this particular blade material, Damascus steel, it's a wonderful using steel. And with the deep edge, you can use it quite substantially without affecting uh, the finish much at all. That's the main reason why I, I choose this finish. So what I do now is I'm polishing the top of the pattern and the valleys of the pattern is, is left unpolished. So the fact that the painted resist that I put on the blades actually didn't work quite to my liking, doesn't affect the end quality of the product. It just adds a little more work for me. So I need to go in and polish the tang of the, of the blade a little bit. It's just a little annoying, but nothing that in the end affects the quality of the, of the knife. Unless, of course, you are not very thorough with the process, but that's what I do. So for this next process, we are engraving the, the logo on the blade. And I developed a technique here where I use a fixture in my CNC and I diamond engrave my signature logo.
So when the CNC is engraving the logos, I figured I'll talk a little about the background of CNC machining in, in my workshop. I was one of the at least somewhat early adopters of CNC and knife making. I bought my first Haas in 2009. At that point, I had absolutely no skill set or any background that would make a, buying a $40,000 <laughs> machine actually a reasonable thing to do, but um, I am trained in drawing in CAD, but that's about it. So I bought the machine. At that point, I would guesstimate maybe five knife makers in the world were using CNC's, at least five that I knew of. So I bought the machine. I did some very, very low level programming from uh, the one day crash course I, I had from uh, the technicians who installed it. And with, within the first week, I, uh, I smashed a half inch carbide mill straight into, uh, into my vise. And it sounds pretty much like shooting a shotgun right next to your ear, which kind of jump scared me a little bit. In any case, the, the machine stood still for six months because of that. I was like, ugh. I, I, I didn't know anyone who could who could teach me. I, I figured I'll figure it out some way, but at the same time I was, what did I do? I wonder if I can send it back, but in the end it all panned out. So actually in order to learn how to use these machines, I took a four day course in writing G code manually, which is not something I ever did since the course, but kind of made the pieces fall, fall together. I, I somewhat understand, or I had somewhat of an understanding of how these machines would work and I just started out with some very very simple projects. You could probably say it was one of the most expensive band source in knife making that I would <laughs> for the first many months but since then I just built on to the skill set and I would say mainly because I did, had no idea what I was doing I was able to succeed with projects that normally wouldn't be able to to happen just because I didn't know any better. So I, I've done some pretty crazy stuff on the CNC machines that trained machinists just shake their head off, but it worked. And if it worked, it's not that crazy, is it? So Jens, why do you put the knives on a piece of painting Ma tape? Yeah, masking tape. It's... Um, it's to protect the finish of the blade now, that um, every time that you actually touch the blade at this point, you need to be careful you don't have dirty hands, but also that uh, the fixture itself and the fixturing don't mark the blade. So it's to protect the finish. So I prepared these handles in zirconium and they're ready now to be heat colored. So before we move on to that, I just make sure to clean off any residue from the tumbling or any fingerprints, anything that will contaminate the finish later on. Zirconium is, if I'm not much mistaken, one of the metals you call reactive metals. It's somewhat in the same range of metals as titanium so you can anodize it. But by heating it red hot, it will turn black, which is super cool. And one of the main reasons to use a conium. So next step for me is to grind down some uh, pivot barrels. The pivot is the center of the the folder mechanism. This is the barrel that the blade will ride on in the assembled version. These are a little long for this model, so I will use my pre-World War II surface grinder here that has been converted into using belts rather than a stone. It's one of those machines that makes life a lot easier when you have it. This is not the most precise, but made due with this for the better part of 15 years or so, but I actually just got a new surface grinder. This still serves a function, but take a quick glimpse here. We'll talk a bit more about the new surface grinder at some point, but this is so cool. Also a 20 grand machine, but <laughs> that's, that's a different story.
The step is anodizing the screws. I'm using uh, titanium screws. These are actually the only part of the knife that I don't make in the shop. I do modify them to a certain degree, but these are super high quality screws made by Steve Kelly. That is beautiful work. Anyways, I want to anodize these in a amber color. Right now they're assassin finished. So I will adjust the voltage on this old girl here. It looks like something from, I mean, the Second World War. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it is. It's actually one that I found in the scraps and resurrected. And uh, I, I really, really enjoyed this old machine. I added a fuse just to be <laughs> safe, right? So one of the things about anodizing is it will change color wherever the part is in contact with the electrolyte. I'm using Windex to make sure that you have liquid in the Torx heads here. The Windex breaks the surface tension of, of water. I just experienced that the color won't hit the bottom of the screws if I, if I miss this step, so. Here you go. Is that it? Yep, that's it. Incidentally, this is a piece of scrap titanium that I made a very fast solution for holding screws. And I would guess that this piece of scrap has been used on basically all the knives that I made the last five or six years. So wouldn't it have been cool if I'd actually taken the time to make a cool piece of titanium? <laughs> So we are back, we just had lunch, some coffee, and um, I lined up for, for the first assembly of one of my casino folders, which led me to the conclusion that we need to talk about nulling for a little bit here. Nulling is a thing that I've been doing all my life. I just didn't have a name for it. Not until I read uh, the book by Adam Savage, Every Tool is a Hammer, where a process that I've been doing for my entire life was actually described as nulling, K-N-O-L-L-I-N-G. It's a way of organizing yourself. It's an, a way of organizing your workspace. It's a, a tool you can use while cleaning up, but also one that you can use while preparing for a specific task. In this instance, I, I lined up all the parts that I need. I lined up all the tools I need, the spare parts, everything. And without thinking about it, I just lined everything up relatively neat. And I realized I was, again, I was nulling. So it's a way the, the French or the, the chefs call this mise en place, everything in the right place. I call it nulling. And it's kind of a way for me to ground myself before doing something important. It will make me much more focused when I start working. I know that everything I need is right where I need it. And it's neatly organized so I can find everything that I need. It's it's something that has always been super important part of just my everyday routines. I will organize everything around me almost to a neurotic degree sometimes, but it helps make everything just run a little more smooth. So coffee, then assembly. So now I've set everything up for knife assembly. In this case, it's a casino, one of my slip joint folders, and I will take you through the, the process. Every part is basically finished. The only thing that needs doing for this knife now is the assembly and the final sharpening. Always wait until the knife is complete before I do any sharpening. That avoids some of those small mishaps where you cut yourself. But everything is lined up and, and ready to uh, to put everything together. Well, fit, 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 fit. So this part of the process, I'm bending the internal spring of the liner. This makes the non-locking lock. And this is a, a little block that I use for setting the right height of the liner in, in my vise. Again, one of these classy, classy um, <laughs> masking tape, a piece of plastic and an old handle from a knife that I made a mistake on, that I made into a little tool. I needed to set the liner at a, 
a fixed distance here. So now it, it goes against this block. In the lack of better words, it's probably a measuring block or a distant block or whatever. So place this inside here and, and this gives me the exact height of the liner. But I probably made 800 knives using this. And it annoys me that I keep using stuff like this. It's just, it works. It was a temporarily solution for a problem, but there's no such thing as temporarily. Temp temporary. Geez, thank you. You drunk right now? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> temporary solutions. That's, just, that's not a, a real thing. One of the reasons why you use titanium for a part like this is that it has a memory. The material itself have a memory for its shape. So it will actually allow for making a, a spring. It has some of the same qualities uh, of spring steel, not to the same point, but enough that it, it has become very popular in, uh, in modern knife making. So this concludes this episode where I build a couple of casino folders. These specific knives are for my Launch 15. If you're not familiar with the concept, it's my monthly online knife show where I sell one-of-a-kind knives and various tools. Launch 15 started a year and a half ago during COVID. I couldn't travel to any show, so I had to do something to relieve my need for an artistic outlet. So each month on the 15th, I have my online knife show where you can buy knives like this casino. If you like what you see, um, please subscribe, like, whatever, here, even leave a comment. I would love to hear what you have to say about uh, what you just saw. Also remember to follow me on Instagram at Enzo of Denmark. And uh, until next time, see you later. Mm -hmm.